Okay, so first things first, you can pick up this booklet um, down at this link here, okay? And um, actually this lecture is part of a full course, or this is a modified version of the lecture I give in my bioinformatics course. Um, uh, you can access it through my main website here. Okay, so today we are going to look at hidden Markov models. Right. We'll start by talking about just plain old Markov models from Andre Markov. So they've been around for a while, and um, Andre Markov is known for developing the branch of mathematics that is really important for modeling stochastic processes, and that's really the case in the life sciences. Right? Uh, I guess students of the life science certainly understand that biological systems are noisy, or stochastic is another word, or we might use variable. Uh, and um, Markov models really, I would say, are one of the top tools that all life scientists should have. And once you understand how they work, they're a very powerful tool for addressing many problems. I'll give you an example with prokaryotic gene finding, a really simple um, version of it. But uh, I would like you to think today about how this could be applied in other contexts. And I, at the end, I give some examples and points of uh, reflection to sort of stimulate um, your, your capacity to uh, take what you've learned with Markov models and move them forward. Um, uh, really, we need something called hidden Markov models that are um, a slight modification of Markov models, and I'll explain that. Okay, so let's start right out into it. A Markov model is really simple. It has three things. It has a set of states. In this case, we have an X and a state Y. And the idea in a Markov model is that you start at any one of these states and your starting um, probabilities are determined, are part of the model. So in this case here, I'm going to start in state X with 80% probability and I'll start in state Y with 20% probability. Okay, so we could think of holding a random number or thinking of uh, rolling dice or something like that. And depending on the outcome of that random number, we would start either in X or in Y. Okay, and we can specify those probabilities. They don't need to be, of course, 80%, 20%. They could be all sorts of things. And once you start in a state, now you, you have a, a notion of steps in, a, in this kind of Markov model. So at each step, you pull a random number, okay? And if I'm in state X, I transit to state Y with 50% probability, or I stay in state X with 50% probability. That's what this so-called self-arc means, is I just stay put. So um, let me show you here. If I pulled a random number between 0 and 1, and here what I'm saying is that 80%, this range here, is all X. I stay in state X. Uh, sorry, I start in state X. And with 20% probability, I start in state Y, right? So if the random number that I pull is 0. 1 here, that means that I start in state X here, right? And that starts what we call a walk. It's a random walk in a Markov model. And the first state that we visit is X. Okay, hopefully that's simple enough so far. Um, so the three things, the set of states, the transition probabilities be to move between states or stay in the same one, and the probabilities for the starting state. That's, uh, that's, that is a Markov model. Now we can do uh, another step in this Markov model. For example, now that I'm in state X, now it's 50% that I stay in X and 50% that I transit. So I pick another random number, and if it's 0.8, let's say, then uh, that's up here, it means that I transit along this arc to Y, and now I'm in state Y. So my walk now is XY, okay? So you might ask, well, where am I getting this random number for from? And the answer is that any modern computer has some sort of function to give you a random number on the fly. Okay. And now that we're in state Y, um, we can, uh, again, pull a random number. But now I'm going to transit back to X with 1 over 8 um, probability. And with 7 over 8, the majority of it, I'll just stay put. And that would mean, for example, I stay in state Y for a number of times. And then I transit back to X and I follow this loop. And then I transit back to Y, and then finally at this last step here, I transit back to X, right? Okay. And we would call that a random walk in the Markov model. And we can do that for as long as we want. I have a link here that you can explore some nice animations on your own time.
Okay. Uh, let's do a little bit more exciting example. Uh, exciting might be a stretch, but uh, a little bit more robust. So here, uh, we have a Markov model that's, that we're going to we're going to define a Markov model with four states that correspond to the nucleotides. Now, the first thing here is that our probability of starting in state A is a quarter, and state T is a quarter. There's no probability we start in state C, and that actually determines right that the probability of starting in state G, which is one half. Why? Because uh, for this to be a probability distribution, they have to sum to one. Likewise, here in state A, if I'm in state A, I have a 40% chance of staying in A 20, 20, 20 for the three other transitions. Note that they also sum to one. And that's, that should be kind of intuitive, I think, for most people. You need all possible events, the, the probability of all the events to sum to one. So for example, if I flip a coin, there's two outcomes, heads or tails, and the probability of heads, is, let's say, is 50%, plus the probability of tails, which is 50%, of course, sums to one. The probability of winning the lottery is some extremely low number, plus the probability of not winning the lottery, which is a very number very close to one, those two must sum to one, because either one or the other happens, there's no other choice. Same thing for rolling a six-sided die, right? Okay, so basically what we're saying here is that there has to be probability distributions uh, that uh, when you're stating, starting in any state, I can fill this in a little bit more. So here, my yellow arcs now are from state transitions from C to the other states, uh, and then complete it with the states for G, the green, and T, the red. Okay, and now that's a fully specified Markov model, right? We have our states, our transition probabilities, and the starting probabilities, right, that are completely determined. All right. And, well, as before, um, okay, well, actually one small thing here is that it's a bit messy to look at this network. So sometimes we switch out to uh, what's called a transition matrix instead of a transition network. So here we just say basically, for example, the probability of going from A to C is 0.2. And so from A to C is 0.2. And the probability from going from G to C is 3. And so, for example, here, the probability of going from G to C is 0.3, okay? And now we can walk in this um, Markov model, just like we did before. Here, um, I need to start uh, in one of these three states. Notice there's no probability for C. So if my random number was, say, 0.83, it would mean that I start in state G over here, denoted by the asterisk, right? And that's the first element of my walk. And then I pull another random number. If it's 0.24, that's less than 0.3. So what we're looking at now is this row, right? Because I'm in state G, I have to look at the probability that I transit to any other state or stay the same at 0.1. So a 0.24 would mean that I transit to state A here, right? So now I'm in state A. And then I would pick another random number um, and depending on that random number here, where it falls, I would choose to follow um, A's, a, a, a transition from A. So that's this row here. So the, the most probable transition would be A to A. In other words, I just stay myself. And so, you know, it should be clear that we could keep doing that random walk for as long as we wanted. And we would get something that might look like a gene or a larger chromosome or a giant genome, right? So it's a way of, um, in a way, generating a sequence, right? When we walk through this Markov model. Okay, so I put here some challenges for you um, to help you understand Markov models. The first one here asks you to basically uh, um, describe what the output from this Markov model would be. And a second one here that's asking you to design a special Markov model. So if you can solve those challenges, then I think you're going to feel pretty comfortable. You can, you can conclude that you're comfortable enough with how Markov models work, right? It's just to help you. Okay, so I'll let you do that on your own time. Um, okay, so then we have uh, a, a, an important adjuvant, uh, uh, concept here of inverting a Markov model. Okay, so before we were given a Markov model and we walked probabilistically through it to generate this walk, right? This sequence of states. What if somebody gave you um, a sequence, right, of states, TGC, TCAAA? 
Well, we could ask, relative to a given model, what the probability of this sequence is, of the probability of that walk through this model, right? Okay, so this is a small sequence, just for examples, but, um, and this is exactly the same model as we had on the previous slides, but you should stop the lecture, you know, if this is a videotape version, and make sure you understand the question that I'm asking here, right? Okay, so, um, what we might do, right, is start, um, just break this down. So, uh, the first element of that walk is a T, and so that corresponds to um, starting in state T. And we know the probability of starting in state T is 25%, uh, 25% one quarter, right? Um, and that means that we start here in this state T. Now the next thing we see is a G. And that means that the walk went from state T to state G. Now what's the probability of this T to G transition? Well, that's right here, from T to G, which is 0.1. Right? So you can see here that my next probability is 0.1 and now I'm in the state G. Now the next thing that happens is I transit to a C, right? So I'm in state G and I transit to a C, that's this arc, and that occurs with probability 0.3. So now I would just add this on to my, um, tack this on to the um, list of events as 0.3. And um, I would walk through the rest of the sequence doing the same thing, just looking up those probabilities from the table that describe how I walk through this matrix, right? And at the end of the day, what I'm gonna get is this long list of different probabilities. Now, if in a full course, you know, I would have spent time explaining a little bit more about what a joint probability is and what that, why we're, we want the joint probability here, but I think it's pretty intuitive, right? in the sense that we want all of these, when we, when we walk through a matrix like this, a Markov model, we want all of those events to um, happen, right? And they all happen independently. Um, that's a, a fundamental property of Markov models, actually, is that um, if I'm standing in some, some state, like state A, the probability that I go out to another state or stay in, in A itself is to not in any way influenced of my past. I never look back at where I was before. I only look at where I am right now. So if you've seen the movie Momentum, Memento, it's kind of an old movie, but it's a guy about a guy who has no long-term memory. So uh, Markov models are basically uh, models that have only short-term memory. In that movie, he tattoos clues about his wife's killer all over his body so that he can sort of keep some sort of memories to help him solve the puzzle, but that's kind of irrelevant. Okay, so what that means here is that we want the joint probability of all these events. What we're saying is that this has to occur and this and this and this, etc. And to do that, you would multiply these probabilities. And so that's going to be 0.25 times 0.1 times 0.3, etc. And you get this very tiny number with five zeros in front of it, right? So, well, okay. Um, um, Here's another challenge. Uh, it's just basically giving you a different sequence, and I'm asking you to drive that same, the probability of this sequence in this model. I should have added another challenge here, which is uh, imagine I gave you a sequence that started with C with any number of nucleotides afterwards. What is the probability of that sequence? In other words, can any sequence in this Markov model begin with a C? So you should think about that a little bit. Okay, so um, in other words, if I give you what we've looked at now is uh, in that last slide is if I give you a Markov model as before and the gene, how do you figure out the probability of that gene, right? Um, so we could write it this way. The probability of our gene of interest, some specific nucleotide sequence was this small number. So it would be a fair question to say, well, you know, why is this even interesting? What do we need to do with that, right? And it's true that we don't really often care about this particular value in and of itself. We use it more in comparative senses. But what I want to, really the rest of the lecture, is to, is to develop this intuition, is that you know our transition matrix in the previous example was somewhat arbitrary. I just made those numbers up. But usually we are actually very careful about how we assign transition probabilities to our Markov model. And we do it so in a way that it captures some salient aspect of a particular biology we're interested in. So for example, um, 
if we were to co create a Markov model that uh, captures coding DNA, what, that's what this challenge is asking you to think about a little bit more on your own time, but um, how would you do that, right? So I think you would take some known examples of coding sequences and uh, you might walk along those sequences and calculating how many times A transits to A, A transits to C, A transits to D, A, A trans to, transits to G, and the same for all of the other nucleotides. And that would be um, essentially a, a model then, a way of building that um, transition matrix that captures some aspect of true nucleotide sequences. So even if this value is not really in and of itself very valuable, basically what we're measuring then in that example is, is just how likely a given sequence is uh, relative to your, to, to your model. And if your model is good, then, it, then really what this is asking is how, um, how likely is that sequence in nature, right? And not necessarily, it's not necessarily the case that all sequences are equally likely, right? So now we can measure that. And that concept really is at the heart of using hidden Markov models, okay? Um, okay, so this challenge here is actually uh, uh, is, is assignment three. It's just a conceptual background to it. And I'll show you that at the end, right? And in the assignment, you'll, you'll actually code this um, in Baker's yeast. Uh, but, okay, so that's a little bit abstract. So let's, um, let me give you a concrete example with gene finding, okay? So this is a common, common problem where, y you know, you have your species of interest, okay? Candida albicans in this case here, but that's just an arbitrary example. Let's suppose you're really interested in some kind of strange archaea or some weird bacteria that lives, you know, in the gut of some animal or whatever it is, and it hasn't been very well studied. So, you know, you get the money together and you sequence the organism. And of course, what you get back is something that looks as boring as this. This is the first chromosome of uh, Candida albicans, except there's another 3.18 billion or million base pairs afterwards, right? But of course, the sequencer doesn't tell you where the genes are. You just have the entire nucleic acid sequence for the chromosome. Uh, the, the computational challenge is to highlight those regions of these sequences that might harbor an open reading frame, that, sorry, an open reading frame or gene, right? It's to basically find where in those unannotated genomes the genes exist. Now, this is not really a gene. It's just an example to show uh, the concept. So let's, let's simplify this even more just for today's purpose. So we can think of a, of a genome as just a long annota unannotated uh, nucleotide sequence, okay, from the first to the last nucleotide, or linear chromosome, whatever you want to call it. And our goal is to basically annotate this um, strand with the places for a gene. So here, here, and here. And we might call all these regions between the genes, or at the telomeres, as non-coding, okay? And we're not going to worry about some really important issues like introns and enhancers and coding and, and uh, all sorts of other uh, genomic structure that's in reality important for the gene finding problem. But let's just keep this a very simple model where we can think of basically walking along this chromosome and annotating each nucleotide as either a non-coding nucleotide or, in this case here, an encoding nucleotide. Okay, so this is your genes are marked by E and the non-coding areas are marked by N. And that's basically what we're going to train the hidden Markov to do is to label this chromosome for us. Okay, so let's start with hidden Markov models. The first thing is that a hidden Markov model is a Markov model, but it has one extra property in that it emits symbols as you enter each state and there's different probabilities associated with different symbols. So let's use an example, but something simple so that, uh, before we tackle gene finding again. So let's suppose you go to a casino and there's a game called Markov Madness, okay? And the idea of this game is that uh, the dealer uh, has two coins that look identical to us, but she can distinguish between uh, the coin that's fair, there's 50-50 heads, and the coin that is biased, uh, it's 90% heads, okay? But we can't see the difference. Um, the dealer does the following. So she picks a coin randomly, 50-50, at the beginning, in secret, behind her back, okay? And 
Then she repeats the following. So she flips the coin in public, so we see whether it ends up being heads or tails. Okay. Then she puts the coins behind her back, and she basically, uh, well, she keeps the same coin with probability 80%. Otherwise, she swaps to the other coin with 20%. Okay. So if she was using the fair coin with 20% probability, one in five, she'll switch to the bias coin and vice versa. And then she goes back to step one and repeats the process. And what that's going to do is generate a series, a sequence of 10 heads or tails, right? 10 coin flips. Okay, so let's start by designing a Markov model to, to capture that part of the story. The first thing is we have two states, a fair and a bias state. The fair state represents when she's using the fair coin, and the bias um, state obviously represents when she's using the bias coin. And so at the beginning, uh, according to this, she starts in either state with equal probability, and then she transits um, from one state to the other with 20% probability, but she'll stay in the same state with 80% probability, right? Okay. So that's a Markov model, of course, right, um, so far. Now what we haven't incorporated is this idea of the, head, the, the coin toss, um, uh, whether it's fair or biased. And that's where we're going to pull in um, the idea of the hidden part of the Markov model. Okay, so just to orientate us here, this is just a copy of the story, right? And what we're, our goal is, is to predict, or is to guess, right, which coin she used for each of the coin, coin, 10 coin tosses. Okay, so if we guess correctly for all 10 coin tosses, we'll win some money. And if we guess incorrectly, we get zero dollars. We lose our money, right? Okay, so now the hidden Markov model is just the Markov model with these emissions. So when you're in the fair state, you're going to admit either a heads or a tails with probability one half. If you're in the bias state, you're going to emit a heads with probability 0 0.9 and a tails with 10%. Okay? So now, let's, take, let's imagine you're the dealer. A random walk in a hidden Markov model now consists of two things. It's the emissions, so tails, heads, heads, tails, heads, etc. But it's also the state. Because the dealer knows what state she was in, right? She knows whether she's using the fair or the bias coin. So she knows that she started in the fair coin, fair state. She flipped the tails. She stayed in the fair coin. She flipped the coin and got a head. Then she switches to the bias coin where she has a heads, a heads, tails, etc. Okay? Um, now, if you're the player, you don't see the states. That's hidden from us. That's why it's called a hidden Markov model. We only see the emissions, the sequence of heads and tails. Our goal now is to guess the state sequence. We want to guess this FF, BB, BB, BFF, right? Now, how do we do that? Okay. But the first thing is to make sure you understand that this is a fully specified hidden Markov model, okay? And the difference between what the dealer sees and what the player sees, okay? All right. So, uh, this is an example of what you might see. I think it's longer than 10 uh, flips, but you get the idea. So the, the, the challenge here for you is to think about what, just by eyeballing, how you would guess the right states, right? So let, let's do a little bit of it here. So imagine I ignore all that. I just see a T. If I just see a tails, right? Which coin was she likely using? Well, it's equiprobable to start in either state. But the probability of a tail is 0.1 with the bias coin, but it's 0.5 with the fair coin. So if I saw just a tail, I guess my most, uh, the safest bet would be to say that she's using the fair coin. If I saw a heads, then I guess I would guess the bias coin, right? Because the probability of heads is 0 0.9 when you're in the bias case. But it gets complicated, right? Because in this sequence, I could start with the tails, which says, okay, I should be in the fair. And then I see a heads, which says, you know, I should be in the biased, but there's a cost that I pay um, for transiting from one coin to the other, right? It's, it, I, get, I get more reward if I stay in the same coin, 0.8, rather than switching, which is 0.2. So it sort of costs me something to switch coins, right? And then it's not clear what sequence of, of heads and tails uh, would be the best one, right? Now, what do we mean by best, right? 
okay, that's what the challenge is starting to try to get you to think about is how to measure what you think is the best guess informally. And, you know, for fun, try to think of the worst guess, like what's the worst job you could do? Okay, but more formally, we have to go back to this idea of inverting a Markov model, which you're pretty, well, which is pretty stri straightforward, right, with a Markov model. And for the dealer who understands both this, who, who not understands, sorry, who sees both the state and the emission, it's pretty easy, too, for hidden Markov model walks. The difference is just these purple terms that correspond to the probability of emissions. So, more specifically, when we, the dealer sees this, she knows that she started with the fair coin. So what's the probability of starting with the fair coin? Well, we know it's a half, it's equiprobable. But then she emitted a tails, right? So what's the probability of emitting a tails with the fair coin? That's 0.5, right? And then she stays in the fair coin. So what's that probability? It's 0.8, right? It's this here. And then she emits a heads. So that's also half. But then she switches from the fair coin to the bias coin, which is 0.2, right? And I could follow through the rest of the, the, um, the, the chain and fill in those numbers, and I'd get some value like this. The point is that this is just like the mark, calculating the, um, the uh, probability for a Markov model, but here you have to factor in those emission probabilities too. Okay, so make sure you understand that concept. So from the dealer's perspective, it's pretty straightforward. What about from the player's perspective? Uh, it's more challenging, right? Because you don't know the state. So how can you calculate this probability of tails, heads, 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 heads? Yeah, you can't, right, directly, because you know, if she's, you don't know if the heads came from this coin or it came from this coin, right? That's, that's the hidden part. So, well, what do you do? What, what's the right strategy? So formally, what you could do is, is basically try all possible different state sequences up here or guess at them. For example, you might say, well, maybe she just used the fair coin the entire time. So if I make that guess and I fill in that, now I can use the same algorithm as the dealer, right, to calculate my probability, right? So I'm not sure this is the correct one, but if I just guess at that, and I, I could write out this equation, which is the probability of this random walk in the hidden Markov model. And I'll get this score here, 0 0.0064. But that's just one of two to the five or 32 possibilities. There's many other possible, you know, options of what the dealer might have done. So for example, okay, that's a restatement, that's all, um, uh, all the fair coin, maybe she used the only the bias coin, right? So if she used the whole bias coin, I can plug that in and calculate the probability, and I'll get something like 0.134. Or maybe she switches from fair to biased, right? So she's in the fair coin and then the biased, right? Or she's in the fair, then the biased and the fair. There's a lot of possibilities, in fact, um, it looks something like this, right? Because in the first position, uh, well, for a sequence of length five, in the first position, either it's a fair or a biased coin, right? That's the first coin toss. If she had chosen the fair coin for the first coin toss, for the second one could be fair or biased, right? Um, if she was, chose the biased coin for the third position, now there could be two choices. And no matter which way you go, there's always two more choices. And so at the end of the day, there's 32 leaves in this tree, and that's because two to the five is equal to 32. Now we want the one out of all of these possibilities that has the highest probability. Which one has the maximum probability? That's, that's, that is a key concept here that's um, not at all obvious to uh, new people in computational biology, but this is the idea of optimization. So we have a whole space of possibilities. And one of those is the correct one, right? It's the correct um, uh, sequence of uh, states that the dealer actually used. We know that because there are only 32 possibilities, so it has to be one of them. And we're gonna choose the one that maximizes the probability. So if I go back to here, if I calculated all of these probabilities out, I would choose the one that maximizes the overall probability uh, out of the 32 cases. 
Okay, so that's a very core concept to today's lecture. And it's something that we come back to in computational biology over and over again. The concept of optimization, of maximizing the likelihood or the probability of an event. It's a really key, key concept in computational biology. But really, it's not specific to hidden Markov models. It's most machine learning techniques. Okay, but for now, um, there's a second problem here, which is that it, the number of possibilities grows exponentially with the sequence length. So just this little sequence of length five, we already had 32 possibilities. If we had a sequence length of 250, there would be two to the 250 possible combinations. And that's basically more than the number of molecules in the universe. So it's simply, I mean, very clearly just impractical, impossible um, to compute uh, every possibility. You, 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 you simply can't. That's, that number is an enormous number. So it, it's not, you know, and 250 nucleotides is very short, right? You know, the average gene has about 1,200 nucleotides. So uh, trying to use that naive approach um, on uh, trying all possibilities on even just a, a, a gene of 1,000 nucleotides, never mind a whole chromosome or genome, is just not feasible, right? And that's called combinatorial explosion. And that's really the start of computational biology. It's what computer scientists struggle with all the time. Now, um, luckily, really clever mathematicians have come up or discovered the Viterbi algorithm, which is beyond the scope of this course. Now, it's not because you're not able to understand as biologists. It's just that it would take several lectures to explain the mathematics that underline, underline that algorithm underlie sorry but it's a beautiful elegant algorithm it's um, and what it does is it takes as input a hidden Markov model like we had and an observed emission sequence and it's gonna find the state sequence that maximizes the probability so in our previous example it'll search over all 32 possible cases for us right and find the one that's best but it does it basically instantaneously it's really fast it doesn't naively try all possibilities. It uses all sorts of clever little mathematical tricks to, to speed that whole thing up. And um, luckily, every package out there in software for hidden Markov models has a good implementation of the Viterbi algorithm. So you'll never really need to lift the hood on that algorithm as biologists unless you want to. Uh, what you just need to understand is what the input and the output of that Viterbi algorithm is. Okay. So I hope that's um, somewhat understandable so far, right? Because to recap, we have to figure out out of this giant space what the right sequence space is, right? In other words, did she use the fair or the biased coin across the 10 trials? And without any other prior information, the best thing that we could maybe do is choose that sequence space or the, that, that order of um, sequences that maximizes the probability. Just searching over all possibilities for the one that has the maximum probability is not feasible computationally because of combinatorial explosion. The Viterbi algorithm though will quickly solve that problem for us. So it'll come back with this sequence space of fair and bias. And that's the one that you would submit back to the casino, right? It's the one that's most likely to be correct. It's not guaranteed to be correct. And on the assignment, you'll be asked to sort of construct a case where it isn't the optimal one. But it's a good, in some sense, it's the best guess that we can make. Okay, so then the, the last thing concept here is how to relate this back to gene finding, right? And I think it probably you already start to see the structure here. So recall that we had this linear chromosome or genome simple model, and we're going to annotate by N for non-coding and E for encoding. Uh, hopefully, we get N in all the non-coding regions and E's in all the coding regions. That would be optimal, right? That would be a way of recognizing where the genes are. Now, to do that, we're going to have a very simple model that's analogous to our dealer of the fair and biased coin, except we're going to have a non-coding state and an encoding state. And the same kind of arcs between, okay? Now, our emissions are not um, heads and tails, but nucleotides A, C, G, and T. And now we have a number of parameters that we have to fill in here, right? And of course, the probability of starting 
in uh, an encoding state? What should that be equal to? Okay, so that one's easy, right? Um, do we really care if we start in an encoding or non-encoding state? It only really affects this first nucleotide as, we're gonna, as we start to walk along this long, long, long chromosome that might be millions of base pairs long. It's in completely irrelevant, so we might as well set, and I don't even think that there's any genes right at the telomere. I could be wrong. So we'll just say that the probability of starting an encoding is equal to zero, okay? It just doesn't matter, right? So let's start in a uh, non-coding state, right? So that takes care of this check. Now, we need to rationalize about these non-coding and these coding frequencies. So think of it this way, this matrix is basically, or this vector, I guess, A, C, G, and T, those probabilities that we put in here should reflect the frequency of nucleotides in the non-coding regions, here, 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 and here. How would we get that, right? Because we don't know in our genome where the non-coding and encoding regions are, right? That, that's circular argument because that's what we're trying to figure out. But we should think of this basically as being sort of the inherent or um, uh, latent um, property of non-coding. And, and what you're going to see is that the hidden Markov model is based on the assumption that the frequency of nucleic acids in the non-coding regions is different from the frequency of nucleic acids in the coding regions. That's what we hope. But how do we get these parameters? And this leads into um, a very uh, ubiquitous concept in machine learning, including hidden Markov models. And that's the idea of training data. Now, let's do this concretely. So let's suppose that this this chromosome that I'm interested in that I sequenced comes from some very rare fungus. I don't know, lives at the bottom of the ocean or it lives in some strange animal's gut. I don't know, it hasn't been studied, but it's a fungus, right? So maybe what we do is we go and we say, well, look, you know, a genome like Baker's yeast, which is also a fungus, right? Let's look at that. It's really well studied, right? We know where all the genes in Saccharomyces cerevisiae are. So let's use the information from other organisms that are really well studied to estimate the parameters for our poorly understood genome, okay? And that's gonna be called the learning set. It's gonna be how we derive these parameters, including these transition pro pro parameters here. Let's go through it st um, step by step. So my, the idea would be to go to the literature, to the databases online, like the NCBI, and you would get Baker's yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae genome, and you would download all of the annotations. And this is so well studied that we know exactly where the genes are. This is a silly example, of course, but we know that there's a gene here, here, and here, and nowhere else, right? Now, that's trusted information. It could be wrong, but we hope that because Baker's yeast is so well studied, that this is a relatively accurate um, learning set. So now, how would we estimate the non-coding emissions? So that's the emissions in this end state. There could be different ways, but one way would just be to say, well, how many non-coding nucleotides do we have total? Well, that's just counting the green guys. Five plus five plus three plus two. So there's 15 nucleotides total in the non-coding regions. How many of those are A's? Well, one, two, three, three out of 15 are A's. How many are C's? One, two, oh, and three. Three are C's, right? How many are G's? Well, one, two, three, four, five, right? So, and same for T. Now we fill in basically the frequency of the nucleotides only within the, the non-coding parts of our learning set, right? Now, that gives us the parameters for emission of A, C, G, and T in the non-coding state. You get it? That's where you should stop the lecture, right? And you should make sure that this is a super core concept, right? Of using a training set to, to parameterize your model. And it's not trivial. So you need to struggle with it a little bit and some of the implications about it. And I, I tried to, in the points of reflection, 
try to give some that later on some um, exercises for you but uh, think of it this way is you know if you wanted to generate um, non-coding regions that look like Saccharomyces cerevisiae you would basically just what this says is you would just basically use the frequency of nucleotides in the non-coding um, uh, regions of Baker's yeast right and you would just keep guessing nucleotides as you walk along right so it's a way of generating a uh, non-coding region in yeast right I don't know if that helps but this idea of generating with that model like uh, by generating here I'm saying as a random walk right okay so that's maybe a bit abstract but it'll come so the opposite of course or the analogous side is the coding region so what would I do there well the same thing but now I count up the coding the nucleotides I know that are in a coding region of which there are five five and three so there's uh, 13 of them total okay and or sorry five six and two that's 13 total five of them are A's two are C's four are G's and two two are T's and so it's gonna so this sums to 13 so that sums to one total the, the ratios and that's the um, frequency of nucleotides in the coding regions or in coding regions right and so what we hope is that the difference between the non-coding region and the coding region are sufficiently large that the hidden Markov model will sort of wake up and realize oh I'm in a non-coding region because the nucleotide frequencies that I'm seeing look more like this matrix right and when it's in a coding region it the the, the, the nucleotide frequencies will look more like this okay now I don't know if that's true we'd have to try it out but that's basis of a hidden Markov model it's a really simple idea really okay now we still have these other probabilities here so what's the probability of starting a gene that's what this arc represents right I switch from a non-coding to a coding region what's the probability of that okay well if we return to our learning set Baker's yeast we could ask out of all of these nucleotides there's 28 of them right green or orange how many of how many times uh, are, is there a switch from the non-coding to the encoding well one two three which is exactly equal to the number of genes right divided by the total number of nucleotides and that means that three out of 28 times you switch from the nuclear from the non-coding to encoding I think that makes sense right so your probability of starting a new gene is basically just the fraction of genes to the whole num uh, to the whole length of the genome okay and lastly so so if we know that this is 3 over 28 then we know that this is 1 minus 3 to, um, uh, um, 3 to the 28 so lastly we have this direction right which is mean says the probability of ending a gene so I travel from an encoding region to a non-coding region so for example here here and here so what's that probability well for every gene that starts there has to be an end to it right so it's going to be exactly the same 3 over 28 if I start a gene somewhere I have to end the gene a little bit later right so that that probability of going along here is 3 over 28 just like this arc here okay so if we know those are 3 over 28 then we can fill in these as 1 minus that and now we have a fully specified hidden Markov model the probabilities were learned in Baker's yeast and now we're going to apply it to our genome that we just sequenced that we know nothing about now what we hope is that this organism is close enough evolutionarily that these parameters still mean something right that whatever property of a gene is true in Baker's yeast in terms of nucleic acid frequency that's also true in my unknown organism here okay in the homework exercise you're going to do that uh, you're going to apply it to a um, uh, an organ uh, to an, uh, um, a, a chromosome that I give you from uh, an organism here I've applied it to candida albicans now candida albicans is pretty well studied I mean we know where most of the genes are which is convenient because I can sort of see whether it's working or not so I built my matrix just like I showed you here but with the Baker's yeast genome and I applied it and here this is a um, on chromosome one of 
Candida albicans. It's also a fungus, right? It's not too far evolutionarily from Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And you can see here that this is um, on the left arm of chromosome one. And you can see out here, it's mostly N's. There are some E's, but then it switches back to non-coding. And then it switches over to encoding as it gets close to this region here, which is actually a gene. That's CTA, uh, what is it? It's, uh, I think it's, um, yeah, CTA2. And now inside of the gene CTA2, you still have some nucleotides that are called as um, non-coding, but some of them, there's an enrichment for nucleotides that are called for encoding. So it's not perfect, right? But it does seem to recognize that now the frequency of, amino, uh, of nucleic acids in this region has switched. It looks more like a coding region than a non-coding region. Now in the assignment, you'll do a little bit more investigation than this, but I hopefully give you the idea, the intuition of how the hidden Markov model essentially labels the, um, the genome uh, by using this Viterbi algorithm, right? So just to make sure it's clear, we see the emissions, right? We see this ACCTGG, et cetera, but we don't see the non-coding and the encoding state, right? Just like that's, that's the analogous to the fair and the bias coin. So what we would do is feed our chromosome into the Viterbi algorithm, and the Viterbi algorithm outputs this sequence of N's and E's, right? Just like it output the sequences of states F and B before. And that's our guess at, as to where the genes are. Okay, so um, there's a lot of tools out there for hidden Markov models. The most popular one for biosequences is Hummer. Um, it's available in R, and you can use it in R if you want for the assignment. Um, I usually use the HMM package because it's a bit simpler. Um, there are nice, uh, so, well, firstly, there's, okay, there's an alternative non-math, um, non-bio presentation for HMMs at YouTube I like. I like. Um, but you know, Markov models get very complex very quickly, and if you're a mathy type person, there's no shortage of very detailed explanations of how um, Markov processes in general work. And there's all sorts of different flavors to them. And depending on whatever language that you prefer to program in, um, there's lots of different packages out there. Some are very hard to use, some are easier to use, but the hard ones are more flexible. Normally what I would do is in the class is then, you know, there would be, uh, we use RStudio Cloud and it has nice packages for offering quizzes and little programming exercise to test students on their comprehension of that individual lecture, right? So this is, for, this is the example of my hidden Markov model quiz that um, students can practice on after class. And this is what the assignment is, actually does look like for this particular lecture. And you go in, and then this would be about, um, by this point in the course, lecture 14, about halfway, this would be something that you could solve in about three hours as uh, somebody who's never programmed before. So you've, by this point, you've come quite a long way, and you would be able to go into R, uh, and I provide some code for the dishonest casino, for the Viterbi algorithm, etc., and you piece those together with the Saccharomyces cerevisiae genome, Baker's yeast, and try to do some gene finding. Um, okay, so usually I leave on some sorts of points of reflection uh, to get people thinking about some of the more difficult conceptual items. So these are types of things where you would, um, y you know, uh, uh, think about them over time um, to help you get those core concepts. And so I think I'll leave it there. Thank you.